Okay, so welcome everybody. We're here with Jonathan John, uh, just joined our development team for the OSE developers, and we're talking about uh, his work program. But one of the things we're developing is uh, is an open enterprise on a 3D printer, meaning that people get to collaborate, kind of like in uh, in what's known as distributed enterpri distributive enterprise, where unlike normal capitalism which tries to knock people out of business as a as a way to succeed here we're saying we're gonna get everybody to collaborate and we encourage others to take our assets and replicate the business and that's the way that we actually grow so we design a business model based on the fact that we're training people that we're demonstrating the work that we're collaboratively developing all the enterprise assets to make a viable business. Uh, I mean, the basic idea is very simple. It's about freedom. It's like, do we wanna put up with the competitive waste or just the constant reinventing the wheel uh, instead of innovation? So innovation as opposed to uh, just trying to make a living. Uh, liberating the time away from competitive waste to innovation and then actually pursuing what we wanna do as human beings. I mean, that's kind of the the greater vision but we're saying okay well why why not get together with a number of collaborators developing advanced open source assets that help help and move everybody along so that anyone can run it so, so for example the 3d printer we've been working on it on our own design for about a year you know, over a year now uh, we've got a decent product and it's time to get that to market um, all the values created a point of sale is one of my big learnings as as I transition from the vision to execution meaning that um, you know what's the actual product that you're offering to people can people actually take it on can livelihoods be made because uh, that's the way that we can bootstrap the the project we're saying the only way we're gonna grow just like Linux Linux grew because a lot of people pretty soon after Linux was developed, people could take on jobs as programmers and so forth. Even though a lot of people claim, oh, it was all this voluntary work. It's not. I mean, it's not. The only way you're going to grow that to a billion dollar uh, movement like Linux is that there's going to have to be livelihood involved. And we're trying to say, well, what does that look like for for the hardware world where it's much more complicated? You're actually trying to ship products. Well, fortunately, in a digital economy, a lot of these... Uh, aspects can be digitized shared collaborated and when you digitize them they become scalable and more people can participate with the goal of um, reducing the the waste and and improving innovation altogether so that's the, that's the vision of the open source economy and, and our humble experiment right now is to start with okay let's let's experiment on this with a 3d printer take the design a website people can uh, run workshops there's various various elements of this enterprise so actually, um, you know, John, I want to actually start, like I was reading a book on Amazon and, and the, the way they do their project teams. And what I like to do is uh, adapt their Amazon team model where they actually start with a press release and they work backwards from, okay, imagine this is our product. So it forces you to get absolute clarity on what you're offering. And then we go back to making all those steps happen. So, so actually start that, I, I want to okay. actually share that. Uh, so, so 3D printer website is, uh, let me paste that link into the, into the chat. Right. If you can see it, take a look at that. Go into the, the website uh, idea. So, we're talking about a website as a way to market product, but but okay, let's let's think about what this what this press release would look like. So you know what are what's the clarity on the product that we're trying to offer? So so I, uh, you kind of have to speak boldly and pre present the good vision so that people can join you. So okay, so I'm thinking of something like Aussie launches first open franchise, right? World. Right. So this is a future press release. This has not happened yet. This is going to happen. Some of the assets I'm discussing here are not built yet, but Here's the vision. OSC announces the launch of its first open source franchise. And this is just a quick first cut that I did and we can refine this and just, just get a starting point. The open franchise, or more specifically a distributive enterprise, is a collaborative enterprise that's st that stands proprietary development on its head. The open franchise actively seeks to train others to replicate its business aiming to put itself out of work. Paradoxically, OSC has shown that such a business model 
allows for stro strong growth of the enterprise, even though encourages others to clone it. The idea is that OSE opens its boundaries to collaboration on creating marketable assets based on its open source work. Further, all the assets are open source for anyone to replicate. These assets in build upon OSE's designs, blueprints, operations, and enterprise documentation, all held under Creative Commons or GPL or OSI compliant hardware and software licenses, meaning it's all uh, absolutely open source. This enterprise, the current enterprise, is a 3D printer business with several elements, from selling kits to organizing ex extreme build workshops, selling information products, 3D printing services, like an online service, books, and other swag. So according to the founder, this is the purest form of free enterprise, beyond capitalism and socialism. By focusing on zero barriers to entry, creative talents are unleashed for livelihood based on purpose, for benefit rather than profit. The enterprise focuses on social production, the experience economy, zero inventory, outsource fulfillment, business automation that allows collaborators to focus on innovation rather than marketing and sales. We're essentially collaborating on all the marketing and sales and product development aspects. The goal is to empower millions of people to free themselves from work that they do not like. As surveys show that most people in the U.S. are unhappy with their work. By collaborating, the vision is that the vast amount of reinventing the wheel and comp competitive waste is replaced with collaboration as a way to transform the world to the open source economy. The most fundamental aspect is the open source product design, where world world worldwide contributors develop and test, test products with FreeCAD as a core design tool and extreme manufacturing is the key prototyping tool. FreeCAD is the open source 3D CAD package and with the support of part libraries and design guides, a number of individuals are able to collaborate after a brief onboarding training period. Every 90 day development cycle, at least one new product is added to the OSC product line, fully documented, free to clone. This allows anyone to have a, an economic incentive for collaborative development while adhering to strict open source and other standards set by OSE. Entrepreneurs are allowed to clone products independently or they can get OSE certification to become qualified producers of goods and services. For example, someone who is trained and certified in running extreme build workshops may be hired by OSE to run, run them under OSC or they can run them on their own using the OSC brand agreement. Extreme Manufacturing Workshops are one-day build events in which a number of 3D printers are built in a single day. People show up to a build event, they pay a workshop fee, and if they pay for the materials, they also get to take a completed 3D printer home. OSC had, has demonstrated such regular build events, dot, dot, dot. So that's, that's as far as I got. But basically, that's, uh, that's kind of like the big, um, the small big picture for now. Yeah. with this collaborative development. What, what are your thoughts on all this? Well, my thoughts are the collaborative business, but um, I'm going to do that. But um, it's, it's like Linux. I mean, I, you kind of made a lot, you kind of collaborated on Linux before, but once one person comes out with um, the product, everyone else, any advancements made on the product, so everyone gets, am I coming through clearly? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty clear. Okay, Every, everyone benefits from um, any advancement you make, everyone else benefits from the same advancement sport. So you kind of become one entity pushing forward anyone else that replicates off, they can choose to, okay, they can open source, they can go their own way, or they can become stagnant. They could always, they can't choose to close source it because of the licensing model of an open source piece of hardware, but they can stay stagnant or they can go with the flow and everyone can merge in the most uh, productive and effective and, yeah. you know, efficient pieces of any advancements made to the hardware and then everyone else benefits and it just builds up the station of everyone versus just a single person benefiting from that station and as an entity mm -hmm. together, you move forward in the space and in yeah. the market increase the market value and you have everyone you have this you're like a huge company but independent entities within a company it like it, 
you know, maybe there's like a giant company called like Nestle or something like that. Well, they have a whole bunch of branches. We have all these people that are doing their own things. They're innovating. They're providing their own methods, their own people, their own knowledge or world experiences, their own professionals, and they're all driving the product forward. And essentially, when with an open source product like this, you really quickly become a huge force pushing the product forward and creating a larger market by merging all that uh, collaborative effort together. Yeah, that's where I really see the strength in this is that you know people think, okay, yeah, you know, like you said, you know, it seems that you might destroy it because you're telling everyone, hey, this is how you build our stuff. Well, the licenses. So we also make open source. Okay, you can differentiate it and have it go with us and keep pushing it forward and benefit from all those iterations as a um, you know, council, like you mentioned, would be produced to um, maintain cohesion between all the entities and identify different entities out there. But like the program you mentioned, making someone a certified partner, someone who is consistently providing good results towards the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I really see you know, huge benefits you know, moving with this platform for uh, this product. And we have some uh, basic space here. We have uh, you know, a house that used to be a ceramic studio that they uh, used to be, the old family here used to keep ceramics classes out of it. And I'm starting to get uh, welding equipment and all the rest, hoping to um, start to build products like this to the you know, farming community around uh, you know, uh, Portage County in Ohio and start to um, introduce these kind of designs and get others to realize, hey, I mean, we can work together on this other engineering students at the university and grab something forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What city are you located in? I'm in uh, Kent, Ohio. It's uh, Kent, right next to Kent State University. Oh, wow, the, the Kent State with the violence long ago? Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> don't wow. Don't want a notoriety, yeah, or hip to me. Oh, yep. wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So, um, d so you're basically, uh, you're self-employed right now. You do pretty much web design, marketing, video. No, no I'm a, I'm a full-time uh, systems engineer at uh, Robisys. I do, uh... Oh. Yep. I do, um, you know, controls for uh, water resources, oh. radios, and I do software developments like fluidized vents, oh. hydraulics, like, uh, you know, um, for a company that makes hydraulic cylinders that flip trains and dump cargo loads, they made a LabVIEW uh, test stand that, you know, me measures the breakaway pressures at different sides of it, ultrasonic flow meters, and controls and before that I uh, started up a company in uh, Lakeland Florida for three years uh, after graduating from uh, UD and once cargo aware uses uh, phase array radar antennas to track RFID tags and product and another one was the uh, metric which is used to track the um, all of the uh, cannabis and everything grown in uh, Colorado so the DEA keep track of uh, everything there and moved up here um, your family again and uh you know start something uh start some business and uh learn more about systems engineering okay uh, yep. yeah sorry i got you confused there's another guy that's awesome with the other skill set okay um I'm interested in that kind of stuff too yeah <laughs> so it's yeah, yeah kind yeah. of a mix between the two guys because I, I mean when we've got collaborated before i mean i was interested in uh starting you know some of that stuff locally as well um but i'm not 100% the marketing guy. I'm more of a engineer, but um, yeah. Oh, also, yeah. <laughs> also interested. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that sounds good. So let's see. Um, what's your what's your level of familiarity with open source? I mean, have you have you worked on open any open source projects before? Or? So as far as open source, um, I, I've just done a 3D printers. I have um, several uh, rep wraps and Delta 3D printers at my house. Well. And uh, you work through that project and didn't really contribute, but just passively, hey, I see something and built it. Um, but as far as that, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a professional. I have a patent setting on some RFID transmitters and done some Arduinos and open source hardware. I'm a electrical and computer and kind of mechanical design engineer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, done lots of those things professionally. They use lots of open source hardware and software like uh, Linux and even robot operating system for a hobby and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very familiar with it, but as far as contributing to an open source project, very little. Huh. You, how much work have you done on, on robot op operating system? Um, I've done, um, I've been uh, very familiar with it and been uh, using it since uh, college. Um, just have it installed and I have a couple of tiny robots I've done some experiments with for, you know, having to move around the house and uh, trying to uh, get something to shovel my driveway present currently. <laughs> oh, yeah? So, have, uh, you know, I have a welded uh, frame out in the uh, garage that's a couple wheelchair motors. Uh, Raspberry Pi and uh, you know it links in into a laptop, which hoses some of the processing. And I'm um, having that. It's in the it's in development, but hoping to have that um, move around and build off of all the stuff I've done in Gazebo because RS has a nice like simulated environment. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to build the real thing. <laughs> you know, you know Gazebo as well. Yeah, Gazebo. Yep. Yeah, very cool. Build, uh, you know, mock up the robots and. Do this stuff. So I mean, I'm just kind of a jack of all trades guy. I'm a ro robotics engineer. I know, you know, controls engineering. You know, industrial controls. I, you know, for city of Cleveland, the wastewater treatment plant. I run, you know, Allen Bradley, all the control. Allen Bradley, Siemens, PLC programming and ladder logic for and PID loops for incinerators, hydraulics controls and programming the whole deal. Oh wow. Wow, that's yep. very cool. Yeah, I mean, that's quite relevant because we actually started on uh, yeah. Ross Robotic Operating System, a system of that for our micro track. We we're going to put... Yeah, yeah. Like oh, yeah, a guy from, uh, what was it, uh, Prepack uh, Robotics for ClearPath. Yeah. That'd be pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, again, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of put some cash forward and build a couple uh, repl replications here. And I see where I can get with it. Oh yeah. Um, would you be interested in building one of the like the micro track? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that that's one of the a power key and a micro track was one of the first things I've been interested in building around here. I'm gonna start small. I mean, I have familiarity with it's it's dangerous. Very you gotta really respect and understand the system to build something like that. And yeah. Some, I'm still gonna start small because I just have done control side not as much on the mechanical side, so I have some to do, but I have a, uh, you know, everyone around here is driving tractors, everyone around here is a mechanic, so I have plenty of help, local help and resources, so I'm pretty excited to build one of those. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, no, that would be, that would be interesting. I mean, we've got a guy on our team, on the dev team, working on the next iteration of the power cube. We're, we're looking at putting together a workshop where we build um, a larger tractor, like 80 horsepower, um, yeah. that would be okay. sometime this year. And that's, that's one team to, to potentially join, but also then on a 3d printer though. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of, kind of like the low hanging fruit right now. Maybe we should, we should just start that. I mean, yeah. That's where, the money, that's where I think the money is. Being yeah. The 3D printer, I think having, yeah. And showing the modularity and being able to build the different, um, frame sizes. Yeah. You know, open source community because out there you know all the people produce rep wraps and all that they haven't seen i don't know if this is quite visible to them yet but as soon as you're able to take this and start using it as a plasma torch table yeah i really see tons of use there and be able to use it you know just for normal 3d printing that's going to be huge yeah 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 that's exact that's exactly what we're doing uh i'm gonna probably get out back to the torch table which is based on a d3d platform our 3d printer the same kind of motion system i'm gonna get back to that uh, i was actually looking doing starting that again in a week that's kind of been on hold since it's been really cold in a <laughs> really cold oh, back here yeah we're like 13 or whatever i'm like i need to build one of those <laughs> yeah. baseboard heat and a little wood furnace i'm like i need to build one of those hydronics or something yeah yeah no that's right but yeah so i would say uh are you do you know python yeah python yep yeah i know uh um, image stuff and all sorts of things in python damn because yep. um you know i mean there's as far as the full product release i mean there's a lot of elements like one one of the elements is an actual design platform within freecad that one of our guys started it uh, okay. but just basically started it there's another guy on our team working on for example, a PVC, 
pipe and fittings library, which would actually allow you, if you wanted to build a frame out of PVC, you could build out of that. So we were actually looking at extending uh, that, the pipe workbench to making frames for the 3D printer, like in an automated design setting within FreeCAD. Because, yeah. So, because that's like, you know, the first thing I took, you know, if you're around, you have Home Depot and Lowe's. The first, first yeah. thing I made with a little robot outside was uh, that. I mean, it's PVC pipes. Uh, threaded, you know, rounded rolled rod coming out of it. Uh, yeah. Harbor tires and bicycle chain with angle. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's yeah. good. Do you document any of this stuff? Do you put it online anywhere you, on Facebook or anything? Or um, I haven't yet, but um, I've kind of replicated a uh, existing online design to kind of get the mechanical stuff and wants to take it and start changing it. That'd yeah. Be nice to start documenting something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm thinking, uh, I mean, what would be the best thing to do? I mean, are you excited about working on a on a workbench within FreeCAD? Or, I mean, because cause actually as far as designing, see, the thing is, as you said, in a construction set approach, if you can modify all the parts to make larger and smaller printers, you can do build whatever size you like. That's that's the true beauty of it. It's all scalable. Parametric. Aside making a parametric, full parametric system for the 3D printer set. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, much. Generating bombs and all that. Yeah, like so within FreeCAD you have an icon. Okay, click on icon. It you know it, it puts in the parts like the the axis or the extruder or the bed or the frame and stuff. I mean I don't know if if that's exciting to you. Um, I mean that yeah. I mean that that work. Yeah, um, just I I'm thinking you know. I've got uh, plenty of free time. Finally got myself kind of set over here. You know, I was excited about this project back in 2012. I think I sent you a book, uh, Steam is Generation and Use or something. Uh, email? Or I, I mailed you a book uh, to your uh, apartment or something way back in like uh, 2012 when I think this stuff kind of started. So. Oh, book on what? I, I don't recall this. Uh... Oh, it's a Steam is Generation in Use. It's a textbook on a steam engine design. Oh, okay, okay. Is that is that like a like a textbook style thick book? Yeah, yeah. It's a oh. big blue textbook of how to make uh, steam engines and all that kind of stuff. Oh, no kidding. Well, thanks. No, I I got it in the shelves. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. I, that was you. I forgot. Okay, okay. Oh, but like those are the kind of things that mechanical mechanical stuff. Uh, hmm. Pretty yeah embedded side in the programming side so i'm just kind of figuring you need and i write tons of documents proposals yeah professional professional engineers so if you need someone that can you really put all sites together document stuff well write reports mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, i can do that kind of stuff and you do the yeah. professional engineering thing as you need it but uh yeah anything's really exciting i mean i'm just uh, really behind general vision of this being yeah you know, around here right i mean so so do you have access to a 3d printer right now um i i do i have a you know airwolf 3d downstairs um i've been trying to repair the extruder side it broke a couple three or four weeks ago mm -hmm. but um yeah i mean how would you feel about i mean would you be able to I don't know, like maybe try, because, uh, see, because there's two ways we're going about the frame. One is we're still exploring the frame. I mean, we've built the, the PVC frame. We didn't get enough runtime on it. It's kind of sitting unused right now, as, as all these things, kind of they kind of need development. But the, the PVC frame looked actually really favorable with the XYZ corner pieces. And another one of our guys is actually building that and finishing that up to get some runs. He's actually in California. Uh, yeah. So we kind of have two tracks going. One is on a PVC frame, which is you can source that anywhere. You can get the parts on Amazon, the little corners. Yeah. So you can have, like, as it, you know, you can pretty much drop ship the entire 3D printer from from Amazon. You know, um, but yeah. then the other route is the metal frame, which requires CNC cutting, which is it's it's uh, of course much more solid. And for the bigger machines, you're gonna need metal. But for the non-contact 3D printer, the frame looks like it's acceptable. And we're going to test it to make sure that it works. Um, yeah. But, yeah, um, I mean, yeah the, the, three, the PVC is a low entry in mass uh, market and sales to local PVC 
people and a quick thing to get people interested in the platform. Yeah. Something and reducing the price below the 350 to 250 that they currently cost. And, you know, of course, you know, dimensional accuracy as you travel down, you can't you lose that very quickly. You have not as tight tolerances. Mm-hmm. Um, metal one, all that goes without saying. You get a, a rolled steel rod like you have for interconnects and magnetic mount, mounts. That's, you can't, uh, you can't lose with that. You're going to have a uh, good tracking along the axis. Yeah. Um, Let's see. All in, really, I mean, both are valid designs for different things because when you're doing 3D printing, I really see it like printers are going to give you 150 bucks that you can afford to make several of them, especially when you're selling some of them. You can have them make lower precision parts because there are lower, lower precision parts that you do not need really great dimensional accuracy, and you always have drill bits available to you. You can uh, under, you know, over, you know, extrude something and then always drill out to make something more accurate. It's a cheap way that you can quickly mm-hmm. get parts. And then you need other, like the Delta 3D printer, you need the, you know, metalized and you know, enclosed, that's the other thing, printer to get the higher accuracies and tolerances. You know, working on 3D printing at Wright-Patterson and Air Force Base, we did, you know, some research over there and working with some of the professors. The best 3D printers, you know, dimensions and the stratasys I work with, mm-hmm. those, those are enclosed. They maintain temperature. They maintain all the rest of these variables so you don't have cracking and warping, and they have those rigid axes, so... Mm-hmm. That print is the next path to that. And yeah. You have the higher and higher quality, and you can start with this, and you can just keep going up and adding to it. So eventually, you have people with their labs having, okay, here's my cheap PVC 3D printer. Is that several is doing low precision runs of these prototype parts, or just, oh, I want to see how something feels and looks. Then you have these metal 3D printers that aren't like enclosed with glass or anything else that are produced in your slightly more precision parts and maybe you have fully enclosed uh, temperature control machines that are giving you mm-hmm. parts you might need for something when you, you know you need to have a tight tolerance that you're printing with maybe a composite film of some sort mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay have you have you ever, ever looked into marlin the software uh... yep um uh, Marlin and a variety of the firmwares um, that they use. I think you're speaking to a um, 3D printer firmware. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. you, how how much uh, have you worked with Marlin? Like, um, just I, I, how much do you understand it? In, yeah. Yeah. Go in and set up all the, you know, grab a new um, $35 step stick controller with the little, um, you know, stepper motor controllers and getting into the firmware and setting everything up you need. Okay, here's here's the gear radius I have. Do the basic configuration of the header files of the C project. But yeah. you know, not the slicing, all the rest of this stuff, that, that kind of falls to you know, my software and programming background. I'd be able to get into it. But as like an expert, not, not an, I couldn't call myself an SME in that, but I'd be okay. able to be one. But that, that's engineering, right? When you're When you're... Professional engineer, you know, on a daily basis, they're like, "Hey, here's a new control system." You're, yeah. you're the expert. You're the expert today. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, because uh, one of the things we want to update, maybe maybe like a, you know, quick task. Hopefully, it's quick. Um, yeah. One of the things we want to update to is uh, filament sense sensing, on our oh. um, 3D printing. Have you have you done that? What filament yeah. runout? I haven't done that, but I'm familiar with that. Um, for um. So I have a the broken 3D printer, and I am slowly ordering parts to go to Delta 3D printer. And yeah, it has the uh, auto leveling. Mm-hmm. You can take a couple of samples, and it's able to uh, calibrate itself that way. Is that what you're referring to? Well, the filament just just uh, so it detects when the filament's going to run out, and it's oh, that's that. set up. It could that be. Um, I yeah, that feature that that's that's easy enough with a uh, you know rotary encoder in uh, producing some parts for that. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's all supported. But what we'd have to do is uh, yeah. right now we're actually building the Prusa MK2 extruder as just like our standard lowbrow extruder. Like we use the MK8, just one of those off-the-shelf ones. We're kind of upgrading to a better one based on a Prusa. Yeah. 
basically copying Prusa. Uh, but we need a run out sensor on that. Maybe um, yeah, that that'd be really comfortable. With that that would okay. I think yeah, you get in the comfort zone. It's uh, embedded software programming, robotics, and mechatronics kind of stuff. And okay, heavy industry and steam and things like that as well. Industrial stuff be where I'd be most comfortable. What what'd you say? Steam. Yeah, steam. Yeah, steam industrial stuff. Steam industrial. Well, that's we're gonna get to that. Uh, Dude, that, that that's what I was trying to say before. I, I yeah. run a uh, three point five megawatt steam generator at the uh, sewer district that, that uh, burns poop to poop <laughs> great oh, wow. power um, for uh, your communities in Cuyahoga Heights, Ohio, and uh, is that for a turbine? You know, yeah. Yeah. What's the scale of that again? Three point four megawatt, megawatt turbine. And uh, the rest of the stuff that goes into that, know about. And I also know about water treatment and wastewater treatment very well. Like, um, oh wow, all that stuff. So like, uh, I have guys that uh, I work with, and I know how to make like self-contained and size um, digesters, and you know it produces you know clean effluent that's water goes out because pretty much what I do is you know me and like five other guys in my company kind of you know we're lead engineers on a plant that takes in all the waste and you know pumps it out in Lake Erie and make sure we don't uh, ruin Lake Erie. Yeah. Wait, is that the company you work for? No, it's a Rovisys. It's a contract uh, engineering company. And uh, so Rovisys, they uh, do the big three tech giants. We do building controls. We do pharmaceutical bioreactors, PID control for like, you know, steel production and all the rest. It's just a, uh, a um, independent controls company just does control system work for uh, all the companies out there in the world just uh, on a project basis. So one day I, I'm mostly at the poop plant and some days I'm at uh, Hyundai, you know, on the assembly line for Hyundai putting RFID to, uh, for tires for scanning barcodes or, and then I'm over here at the, you know, Smuckers or something. Uh -huh. Putting the back process control for a tank. Mm -hmm. So, all those kind of things. What's sorry? What's the name of the company you work for? Oh, it's R O V I S Y S. R O V I S S. Send a link and. Uh... Yeah, sure. Okay, so do you know about uh, saturated water? Saturated. Uh, not saturated steam, but saturated water, for example. water as, as far as um steam control i know about the control aspects of it which is different than the physics aspects of it i know how to set up the uh, pid loops and the um so i, I guess what i'm getting at is no the quick answer is no i don't know that mm -hmm. but i know how to control a, a steam turbine and a boiler such as like you know producing P, the pid loops to mm -hmm. uh, you know, inputs and outputs to it how to um You'll put a whole bunch of strain gauges on it to be able to measure the vibration of it and, um, mm -hmm. and control as, those things that way. As far as the mechanical systems there, the pipes the that generate the steam, I mean, do you know any of that design or? The basics of it, yeah. What do, right. Tell me, what do they do there for the, the 3.5 megawatt scale? What is it like a, it's not a coil, it's linear pipes. Oh, the generator? Um, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a uh, steam uh, ga GE gas, uh, GE turbine, and it has a, uh, what's called a fluidized bed incinerator that all the uh, waste, all the waste from the wastewater goes into, all the solids. It makes up a polymer that makes it a bit more um, flammable, which is just uh, made from uh, waste from other processes and other industries. And so it's um, made, and that's put into this fluidized bed incinerator, and that generates uh, steam to power this uh, G generator, this just has a whole bunch of fins. It's a, it's a standard. Yeah, yeah, um, standard turbine. But how do they, how do they, the, the steam generation part, you know how that looks like? What that looks like? Like, is it yeah. a, like, what is it like, two inch, like schedule 80 or whatever kind of pipe that's got water in yeah. it that just gets heated? Um, yeah, so effectively, uh, you have some, you have, well, you can't really even call it a pipe. It's 
Yeah, the processed water is going to go through a water treatment plant that's going to completely clean and desalinize the water. They have a whole water treatment plant in there that takes the, the processed water and completely scrubs and cleans the stuff out. And it pumps it into the, you know, basically pipes, like you're saying, that live on top of the fluidized the bed incinerator. And that is just a giant heat exchanger, like like you're saying, that um, then just pumps the steam yeah. you know, in sealed, uh, insulated pipes to the uh, process area. But um, there is just a huge series of uh, relief uh, relief valves, um, pressure monitoring, and a temperature monitoring. Yeah, what are those pipes like? How big are they? Are they like two inch pipes? Um, you can check out, but I mean, generally, I mean, this is, this is a really, a, the generator actually is very small. It, it, it would fit right behind me. It's, it's tiny. It's half the size of a small car. It's a tiny, tiny little thing, the generator for this entire plant. With flames running through it from the... But, yeah, the pipes are, um, pipes are small. You know, like you said, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're um, they're around, uh, you know, one foot in uh, diameter uh, leading into it. But, uh, you know, again, I'm on the uh, control side. Yeah, I saw yeah. The mechanics know the basics of what's going on, enough to do pit controls and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because um, one of the, some of the things we're doing is uh, with the linear solar concentrator, so we want, like, the technology yeah. for, yeah, modern steam plus linear solar concentrator, I just found out about this company called TerraJoule, and they're doing exactly that. Basically, the idea is you can take a regular propane tank, you heat the water up, uh, you actually shoot the steam that you generate into this this tank of water, and then it rises in temperature to about like 200 Celsius, but it's kept within like 18 bar, like. Uh, 18 atmospheres and that just stores incredible amounts of energy that you can release at night and they're saying that they're getting like hundred dollar per kilowatt energy storage which is like holy cow because uh, batteries cost like four hundred dollars per kilowatt so, I, I think that's that, that's super that's gonna be super awesome being able to store yeah steam high and I, I've, the other thing I've seen recently, it's super interesting in the energy storage, especially heat storage, because heat is how we burn all of our energy. Yeah. Uh, is um, molten so salt? You know, you have a, a salt. Yeah. And you have a, a salt liquid, and if you um, there's little like heating pads you hold in your hand. Yeah, yeah. And snap, and it crystallizes. Yeah. Transfer from uh, liquid to crystal produces tons of heat. Yep. Some companies have produced. Uh, skids or industrial skid processes that a skid is just a modular module for a big industrial plant that can store heat inside of those little cylinders and release it in a controlled manner inside these crystals. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Yeah, I saw that link on your log. That's it. Yeah. Yep, yep, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's all It's all really good. Um, maybe, but for now, maybe let's look at... Um, like as a very focused task, like talking about the next 12 weeks. Um, Filament stuff, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so would you be interested in, like in this process as we get started? Because part of it is some development, like for example, the filament sensor, um, this, the developments we are doing on, uh, on extruders. I mean, for example, we are get. yeah, maybe that would be a good thing, because we're, we're doing this, 1.75 millimeter based on a Prusa, just as a simple, quick thing because it's all open source and we can pick that off, uh, cherry pick that, and then we wanted to move on to a larger extruder with the, with the volcano nozzle, like a much larger one. Right. Uh, that's, that's for the larger machines, but so, but the thing is, it's like okay, it would be good to the the idea is if if you were to get into this it would be good that you have the machine that actually can use these things so you can actually test it fully right so yeah. i mean would you be able to build um i mean i guess build one of our printers pretty soon or yeah 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 so yeah i have um i, I kind of have the expendable extra income that's why i'm kind of coming in that i can uh, build some of these machines and uh, start to uh 
the design and prototype some stuff around here. So mm-hmm. you know, I kind of have um, you know, my budget sort of like uh, three to four hundred a month or five hundred a month to be able to uh, build some of these things. Yeah, well, that definitely would. Uh, it's like three fifty for the materials. Um, what about uh, so if you get the frame CNC cut? I mean, that's going to be a little more. Do you do you want to try try out the printer with just the PVC connectors? I think that might be it might be, it might be a fun uh, thing to try. Yeah, definitely. It might be super cool. Yeah, yeah, because um, because uh, we did like three. It was three quarter inch for the. Uh, one of our smaller printers. Yeah, yeah, maybe that would be good because, um, and then you can put on the bigger, bigger print head. Maybe have you start working. So there's one is one side is the filament runout sensor, but the second part is the larger extruder that right now nobody on our team is working on that. Maybe we could get you going on that because that's a definite, definite thing we absolutely need. Because if we're talking about like real size not just tiny little objects but you know starting to make larger useful objects like uh, like up to yeah. rubber tires i mean all kinds of stuff like polycarbonate glazing i mean we want to print that too pvc fittings well, and stuff I, i'd have to I'd have the people around me to help with that my wife works at a ceramic supply company we have some people around here doing the clay printing and all that kind of stuff oh uh, no kidding you guys also um have access to the clay extruders like anyone got a have you seen yeah, a clay extruder yeah. at work uh, my wife's on you first know i'm basis with someone i don't remember i'll have to they'll get him introduce you um he's uh working on um five ceramic supplies from ohio ceramic supplies around here okay and, uh, you know he's printing ceramics and printing odd uh really cool sculptures and stuff using a 3d printer but that's oh no kidding they have people and i'd be able to reach out to so that could be something i'd be comfortable okay with. So that's cool i mean that's really i didn't i didn't, never thought that i mean i sort of have but that's super cool that there's larger um extruders out there yeah there and are there are i mean rubber, that's super cool with rubber because i don't know if you're familiar i uh you know that, that's how tires are made I, absolutely controls that good year and uh, they have bobbins bobbins and spools you know and three units on a little you know they move around that has a pneumatic brake on it, and it just spools off rubber into the machine. That uh, just pretty much deposits that into the mold. Oh, yeah, they do it. Yeah. That's so they don't, like, pour it in? It's actually deposited as a string? Yeah, yeah, it's fed in as a, uh, a strand of rubber. That's how uh, huh. you tire it from the feet of a little you know, thin strip of wire uh, rubber going in. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, and did I, they? I guess they kind of, I did they actually? Share. So is that like wire braided tires or just like plain rubber tires? It's plain rubber. Uh, it's it's the first part of the process where um, they have the the wire and the rest of the stuff and the tire inside the inside a little cavity that they feed the rubber into, and then they um, you know that gets blown up and it gets vol- and it goes into the high pressure thing that vulcanizes it and all the rest later, but. The uh, raw rubber supply is uh, actually on spools, bobbins. Huh. I didn't see much beyond that. Just you know, they said it was just fed in. I didn't, much, I didn't see much visually, but you know, I, just, I, I find that interesting. Is that some I, yeah, a project you worked on? Yeah, with uh, Robisys. Again, like uh, the controls engineering on a project basis, I'm going from company to company to company and seeing how how it's made. No, oh, that's on pretty a, good. That's pretty good. Basis. You know, I'm at Smuckers. I'm at Hyundai. I'm at good year i'm at you know some other place yeah because i mean we we've talked about like once we have the larger extruder but then also wow. you'd have to have the feedstock because we i mean we're, we're also working on um on a filament well, maker itself yeah but yeah then you have to have a lot of spools because that gets expensive if you want to print something and you don't have the cheap cheap feedstock yeah oh man yeah you know being able to uh, print and produce filament off of uh, pellets and all the rest of that kind of stuff the fill extruder and all those other guys out there yeah 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 all right so i would say i would say how about this let's get you going on okay so first first level exercise let's let's get um get you to do the filament sensor just add that to our code so we have our existing code uh, but maybe like if you can um so on your log i mean of course document everything but take take down our code have you you have used uh, OSC linux you downloaded it yeah. right yeah okay so on it is the copy of Marlin 
that we currently use, okay. right? That's awesome. All right, cool. <laughs> you guys have lots of stuff built in there. Yeah, I just did it in a virtual box. That's uh, kind of the fast way to get that uh, up and running. Oh, uh, you did OSC Linux in virtual virtual box? Yep. Okay. Uh, but anyway, the the Marlin that you pull off, uh, you, we use Cura. Have you used Cura? I haven't heard of that, no. Okay. Well, we use Cura, but in Cura, once you start that up, it's in OSC Linux, then you can open up, well, in, well, first of all, it's Arduino environment that you up upload the stuff, but it's but the R code yeah. is in Arduino. It's like when you download OSC Linux, it's in there. Yeah, so, it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'd like you to first take that and enable whatever it needs. I, mean, I don't know how deeply you have to modify it. Enable the make make the filament sensing work, but also what's the hardware to make it work. So put those two pieces together. That's the interesting part. It's going to be new new hardware to kind of uh, get a right ultra efficient uh, way of uh, that we can add OSC. Yeah, I mean I'm sure they've got they've got yeah. different sensors that are standard. We just never never done it yet. Um, so that would be good. So I'm going to go to your log and actually write you a, a little... Um, Absolutely. So I'm going to edit and l I'm going to say, so... Yeah, thermal batteries, I'll put it above that there. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about the 12-week the plan. Okay, so first... open source the filament run out sensor meaning like if the filament runs out it stops the print and you can reload more filament right and yeah uh, run, so let, let's say our scope here is yeah we produce the filament run out sensor which is a mechanical and electrical design of something that will interface with the pre-existing uh, Marlin firmware um, Yep. Yep. And it do clearly documents the required uh, modification of the code and distribute it for this uh, filament sensor. Because uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and you know, addressing that. So really, I think at yeah, first things is just kind of identifying scope and identifying I can kind of do that. The final, like yeah, filament runout sensor. And we want to have the mechanical part. And we want the software part of it. So I kind of do it. First couple of weeks, just you know, week just scr scrying around, documenting, and producing concise um, entries, and then a blog about a design specification. It's something I do, you know, you do an engineer, you make a design spec, this, you know, or functional spec. This is what this thing's going to do. You're going to do this, and this is what's going to happen. This is what it's going to look like. Here are different designs I look like. So I expect the output, you know, in uh, two weeks to have for the team to present mm -hmm. a uh, can chart as soon as we can about different design alternatives for the mechanical aspects of it. Um, so, okay, that sounds good to me. Um, w then, how, you think that's going to take first couple of weeks, and then to actually, then then we're going to so so there's the design part including like the FreeCAD modification. You think you could get into free like take down our existing extruder and modify it? Um, modify the existing extruder to have that feature, yes. I, yeah. would, I would be comfortable with uh, Chad, you know, done plenty of, yeah, oh, it's like, FreeCAD yeah. has been a learning curve for me. Like, yep. I went from Autodesk and, you know, SolidWorks and SketchUp, like, you can track off a feature, and you can directly extrude a feature. Yeah, but uh, recad a lot of new newer concepts and things. But I'm I'm sure I'll be able to figure that out. How to uh, you know integrate that? Yeah, you can definitely do that. You can basically go on a single face and you can draw a shape on it and extrude it out. I mean, yeah, it's got the same thing. That's all in there, um, which I really like. Just yeah, just the sketcher onto the different faces. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so continuing. So that's gonna take a couple of weeks. Um, okay, but then about building it. So maybe like week three, start on looking at um, build one of ours with PVC. Okay. Does that sound good? What's that? 
Oh yeah, you're you're right. You're introducing like a log, aren't you? Yeah, I'm I'm actually okay. editing the oh, so. Oh, oh. Down, yeah, yeah. I think third week makes sense. Um, so I can get the build materials, get some of that stuff together, and just place an order, have the parts over here. Um. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen with you right. there. So. So twelve week plan. Yeah. So maybe look at uh, do the D three D ver. Okay, but. The D3D PVC version does not exist in CAD. So, so um, now we've got all the different parts, all the modules. As you said, someone had already worked on um, creating uh, PVC primitives in FreeCAD yep. for other people to use. Yep. Uh, however, we don't have the corners. Maybe, maybe I could ask the guy to do the corners too. Actually, I think I should. Yeah, yeah. Ruslan is one of our guys. He's from Germany. He's uh, he made a macro that generates any kind of fitting, which is that's really really useful. But we don't have the 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 yeah. corner section, corner pieces. Those are pretty special, specialized. But uh, yeah, we could definitely add that. Um, yeah. So maybe do the design. You think you can do the design? Spend a couple of few weeks on that. And yeah, then build I it? that's something. Uh, do do uh, several weeks on design of you know have as soon as I can something for like a yeah you know research the software code that shouldn't be too big of a deal. It's an existing feature. That's not just reading and looking at the internet for a while. Mm -hmm. But the, the you know just getting a Gantt chart and getting design together for the uh, extruder modifications that mm -hmm. will allow uh, measuring the filament. You know, yeah. Because I guess, you know, it'd, it'd be nice. So I guess there's there's two parts of this. Maybe I'm, I'm pushing it further than it needs to because there's out of filament, which is just, I mean, that's just a discrete. But what about measuring how much filament you're using? Yeah, no. The, kind of don't worry about that yet. There's uh, one thing at a time. That's there's yeah. There's already stuff out there that has filament width, width sensing. But don't worry yeah. about that yet. We've got a, yeah. another guy that can really handle that because he's been working with that. Um, so, so, so one thing at a time here. Yeah, I'd say what we need to be careful about on, on design stage, a critical part here is just, this comes from project management stuff, is uh, you know just work breakdown and yeah. also knowing alternative programs and projects that are running. Like, we're going to, you know, it's like the goal, global vision. We want to be able to have, you know, measurement of width, to account for how much volume we're extruding, how the speed to you know how much is left in the spool, to also you know hey we ran out of filament, and uh, making sure those are compatible. Whatever design I have might be at least compatible with the future design. Yeah, so I, I'm just throwing that out there, but maybe that's less of a concern. Because no, don't don't worry, really don't worry about it for now, because it's like the way we go about it. Like you might be using different spools. That the critical thing right now, like in terms of, I mean, this is a use case. Like like when I'm thinking, like sometimes I load up a new spool. It's got you don't know how much it's got. It's just too complicated for now. But the thing that's definitely valuable is not having a print fail because you ran out of material. So that so that stinks. Time and energy, and also when it gets jammed up, just those two cases are the ones that kill you. Uh, jam or uh, lack of jam. Yep, like a jam, but a jam you can't, you know, can't really. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Order, you well, can really affect that something. You know, both the combination of several things can see that. Yeah, so you can... the rotary encoder. I mean, yeah. Existing, just, I'll think about it. Yeah. I'll, I'll no, I would say, dude, don't don't worry about it for now, because that's I mean that is definitely the kind of stuff we we're gonna get to later, but there's just much more important things right now that we need, like, like really getting a solid printer. I mean, we don't need that feature to roll our pr our printer out to the workshops and make it really replicable. Like the number one thing is to really nail the production engineering, meaning how do we build these things exactly? Make sure all the CAD is right that when we put it up on online i mean it's it's accurate and everything is there so th so there's just some priorities and what i want to do is that like you know like for example we mentioned the clay clay extrusion yes absolutely but not right now i mean that would you know totally derail the current work so and of course as we get more people we can get more people on uh, on the other projects and that's exactly the plan as we go along we can have more people uh 
tag teaming on this. Uh, the the people that you said are, are working with the clay, they they're also burning it, right? They're they're um, kilning it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that would be what I thought that would be really good for is, say you even want to make like, like casting molds for for doing metal. Oh, yeah. Man. Like direct molds or non mossy molds. Yeah. Non yeah. Molds. Yeah, that would be. We have a kiln at our house and stuff, so. Yeah. Have access to lots yeah. Of those resources yeah. But don't worry about it for now. That's that's good to know that you that you've got that. That's mm -hmm. discreet. Hey, are we out of filament? One little thing and getting the modification to our existing. Yeah, yeah. Very simple thing. So I'm am thinking like you you know if if there's a, like a it might not even take you two weeks or twenty hours to do that. It's, it might be just yeah. really even simpler because it's all uh, a lot. I think a lot of it is pretty much all all out there. But I haven't looked at it, so I just can't tell how much time it's going to take. Um, okay, so let's take take a look at tentatively week one and two. We do the run out sensor, um, and then the, the point, just the run out. Nothing else at this point. Yep. So essentially, essentially the rationale is, uh, which I'm writing down, not losing a print, especially a long print, <laughs> a long print when the filament runs out. You can simply continue it by, by reinserting filament. Yep. Yep, just uh, keep it simple, stupid, uh, basic, hey, you're out of filament, and we can replace the filament. Yeah, so, so, I mean, the thing I would imagine would be it, it detects, detects run out, it saves the position, move, probably moves out of the way, and then you reload the filament and hit continue on the um... printer. Yeah, yeah. we uh, just stop the process. Yeah, yeah, Whatever. and that should be that should be all within Marlin, but I just don't know. Okay, so let's say tentatively week three to six, we design a PVC version, and you can also look at you know look at bill of materials ordering and stuff like that. But I would say three to six is design design the version fully. Um, I would say week seven, do the BOM and um, update, uh, generate a new BOM. So, because that will have some. What, what we do is for every version of the printer that we have, we we start a new BOM so it's complete and comprehensive. You don't have to like cross reference stuff. Yeah, um, sure. Yep. So, and then build it. It should take you like a couple of weeks, a few weeks. Could take you a right. few weeks to build it. Um, yeah, Eight, nine, ten. Building and all that experimenting. I'll take a while. Yeah. Tuning it and uh, tinkering with it. Because I'm sure there's going to be plenty of uh, tinkering, getting that to work. Well, I mean, hopefully not. Because, I mean, if we've got everything as... I mean, we pretty much documented everything as far as the exact parameters and everything. So you should it shouldn't be a lot of messing around. As long as you get the geometry proper, it should be pretty much straightforward. I mean, we've done all of that already. I mean, I don't think... Yeah. You're gonna have to mess with a lot of that too much. Just so, yeah. yeah, just the PVC. But the critical thing is just to let you know, like when you change the dimensions, because now you're gonna. That's why the the cat is important. You're gonna change the dimensions, and therefore things are gonna align yeah. differently. And that's all the stuff you're gonna have to figure out within CAD to make sure that your CAD drawing shows you. Okay, now I'm getting exactly this 12 by 12 inch bed, fully. Uh, fully covered so I would say the PVC version um, with a 12 inch print bed because we're moving to the larger 12 inch print beds yeah right uh, that would be good it's it's just much more practical to, to get like one you can just fit so much more on a single print oh, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. it's like double a normal printer there yeah, yeah exactly that's um, a heated ABS bed right say it again that's a heated ABS bed Right. Heated bed with um, heated bed with uh, just um, what we do is we use aluminum and then we use a PEI surface on it for the non non sticking once you oh, finish cool. the print. Yeah. Um, I'll get into that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I would say week eight to ten the build and then and then after that we will see. But after that is the large extruder. Right. Oh, cool deal. That's a lot um, of stuff, but uh, it's pretty exciting to get this 3D printer built over here. 
Yeah. And get out, get push out some new features. Yep. You know, I'll be able to work. Uh, I think what my, what I'm kind of managing my time is uh, usually um, I have some free time eight to uh, eight to ten usually mm-hmm. on evening, weekdays, and of course I have some time Saturday and Sunday. Um, so I kind of just do uh, little bits and updates uh, throughout the week and, and put in uh, ten to twelve hours. Excellent, and excellent. Should have time to kind of reach this stuff, I think. Excellent. Uh, can you join us on Tuesday? Um... We typically have the meeting at no. You're at work at, but we have the meeting uh, Tuesday yeah. 2 p.m. Nine um, to five EST. Uh, I'm okay. at work, but I, you know I can always take my lunch whenever I want to take my lunch. So okay. You know, what's the meeting time? I can just take. It's well, 2 p.m. Lunch. CST. Oh, it's CST. Yeah, 2 p.m. CST. Okay. You're in CST, CST as well. I'm in uh, Eastern. I'm in uh, oh. Ohio, so I'm at uh, Eastern time. So I would that would be uh, t- three one. Three, three. There'll be three for you already. Right, right. Can you make that, or that's a little hard for you? That maybe. Uh, that'd, that'd be a real late lunch. So no, I don't think I can make that. I could. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to work around it. But we record all the meetings, so you can review the the meeting that we have. Right. Mhm. Mhm. Part of the yeah. same teams keeping up in the meetings. So. Yeah. Definitely keep up and uh. Let you guys know if I have any something to contribute. Understand what we do for our meetings. Yeah, yeah, it sounds good. So no, that's that's really cool. So yeah, anything else we want to cover right now, or? No, I think it's just uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you for welcoming me to the team, and uh, hope to get some work done. Yeah. And, uh, it's been it's been five years in college and three years in business and stuff, and a whole lot of me wanting to do stuff and not so much. Uh, doing a lot of things it's hard yeah, you probably know it's hard to get all the direction and focus together and been watching this for from a while since like 2012 when i was in school and now i'm like okay cool very cool awesome yeah very cool well all right and thanks for sending that steam book that's that's cool yeah uh, so yeah yeah that's the same for the steam stuff you guys are working on definitely uh, grab that because that has detailed design of everything that is Bob Babcock and Wilcox's steam Bible that a mechanical engineer uses to produce That's right. generators and everything. So definitely grab that. Yep, yep, yep. No, definitely. Definitely. All right, John. Well, thanks so much then. Yeah, so yeah, email me if you got any questions and we'll be in touch. And uh, yeah, welcome to the team again. Well, uh, God, God speed to you out there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks a lot. Take care then. Yeah, Mark Marson.